This video is sponsored by Rocketman. Check out the link in the video description or keep watching to find out more. Hey everyone, welcome back to RM Transit for a particularly nerdy video, even for me. When the new Ontario Line project in Toronto was announced, many people were concerned that the trains wouldn't be compatible with the conventional subway network, and I think that raises a great question globally. When you're building a new subway line, does it make sense to build using the existing specifications and train designs you already have, or to use something completely different? And should all your lines be connected and intercompatible? Let's talk about it. I've talked about the Ontario line in Toronto a bunch of times, so let me spare you most of the details. Suffice to say, it's probably going to be North America's most modern subway line when it opens in the late 2020s, and it's diverging from Toronto's existing subway network by using shorter station lengths, a different track gauge, and overhead wire for power, which, okay, it is used on the Eglinton Crosstown line, but I'm talking subway subway. It's important to realize that this isn't really a conversation about Toronto. Toronto is just the motivating example, to put it in academic terms. Does having the same type of trains on every line not make sense? Should lines really not all be connected up? The concerns with this whole situation with the people I talk to in the local transit space are honestly fair. Here in Toronto, and in a lot of older subway and metro systems around the world, you tend to have a lot of your lines connected up and often using the same train technology or even the exact same train models from line to line. And so the question of should we be building new lines to different standards is a natural one to ask. To make it more clear, I'm going to list a bunch of the concerns people potentially have with building a new line to different standards than your existing network. And again, honestly, these are often really reasonable concerns. For one, if different lines all use different technology, would maintenance not be much less efficient? When you have all your lines connected up, if one maintenance site is busy, you can potentially move trains to another that's less busy. And if you have a larger fleet of similar trains, you can order more parts at once, giving you economies of scale. At the same time, not sharing tracks or having track connections means that during periods of line blockage or disruption, you couldn't have trains travel from one line onto another, or potentially even travel from one yard to serve another line. And that could mean that an important line is left without any or severely reduced service, which is obviously not ideal. Probably seen as the biggest issue is the fleet itself, since with new different trains you might need different parts than your existing rolling stock. You might not be able to use the same equipment, and you'll need different mechanics for different trains. Of course, there are also concerns about new transit lines not being built as large, or perhaps not being built as small as they could be, though I think it's a lot harder to classify these concerns on a broad basis, so I'll address them separately. Now, I'm going to get into why I don't think a lot of these concerns are actually big issues for subway or metro systems. But before that, a quick message from our sponsor. Now, if you're fortunate enough to be located in a Canadian city and you're watching this channel, chances are you're taking public transit. Streetcars, buses, and maybe even subway trains. With the Canadian winter in full force, I made sure to save my local bus stop and subway station and Rocketman, so that I can check when my next transit vehicle is coming before even walking out of the door. I also use Rocketman to stay informed with real-time transit delays and alerts right in the app, and I can even find out exactly where my bus is with live vehicle locations for a seamless travel experience on transit. Join me in using Rocketman today. Check out the link in the description and download Rocketman for free on both iOS and Android. Now, as I've already mentioned, I fall into the camp of believing that we don't actually need to connect up every rail line we build in cities. I also don't necessarily think it's that important to have every train be compatible with every other rail line. But why is that? The first thing I like to look at whenever any kind of issue like this comes up is what's best practice and what do cities around the world do? And it's actually really fascinating on the issue of intercompatible trains and connected lines. As it turns out, a lot of the world's earliest rail systems, strangely enough, are actually pretty intercompatible and heavily connected, despite the fact that many times they were created by combining completely separate rail companies. In both New York and London, which I talked about in an explained video last month, the trains on the main subway networks are all intercompatible. Whether or not they can all fit in the same stations and tunnels is a different issue, but they can run on the same tracks. And generally, the networks, line to line, are heavily connected, sometimes even with services running from one line onto another. 
looking at more modern systems, it feels like there's a lot less of a trend. Sure, in cities like Tokyo, there are only a few standards, okay, relative to Tokyo's massive size and the fact that there are a lot of one-off lines that I wouldn't consider part of the core network, Tokyo really generally seems to have the same loading gauge and 1500 volt DC overhead power for new lines. Beyond that though, it seems like a lot of newer systems have various different lines that often use different train types or even train technologies, from Shanghai to Taipei to Singapore to Hong Kong. And examples aren't just limited to Asia. Santiago, which I talked about again in another explained video, has far more different rail standards than Mexico City, which was a system that developed largely earlier on. Now, of course, we need not use different technologies for every single line, but over time, it clearly makes sense to change your standards, be it for technological reasons or because we have a better understanding of what type of service we should be running in different places. Now, I'd be remiss not to mention that it certainly seems like a trend, kind of across the world with newer lines, to package them out as single units, or at least as more unified independent packages, in order to have competitive bidding for their construction and design. This makes it a lot easier to put the risk on a contractor and to create competition from one contractor to another. And sort of counterintuitively, this also encourages some small level of diversification in options because the different contractors are all going to want to propose something different, which might be able to give them a competitive edge, even if that often comes down to things like aesthetics and minor design details. At the same time, what makes sense to build changes over time as we get better and better at building transit. For example, on older systems, we often had to opt for larger trains because we didn't have modern signaling and platform screen doors that allow modern systems to operate at incredibly high frequencies instead. At the same time, best practices change. And so, for example, in the past, third rail may have seemed like the ideal option, even if overhead wire was still an option. But these days, overhead wire is seen as preferred for new subway lines. I talked about this more in my third rail versus overhead firepower video. And of course, if you have a new independent line, there's no reason for it to not go with the best practice, especially if the risk is going to be on those building the line, not those operating the system as a whole in the long term. Interestingly, to some extent, some cities might counterintuitively be standardizing by moving away from old standards. The more you look at historic transit systems, the less actual standardization there was. For example, back in the day, there used to be a lot more super narrow train systems, be it because those sort of systems were derived from trams, and to some extent it made sense to have narrow trains. But something you might notice is that newer subway systems more and more frequently use wider trains. At the same time, voltages and power delivery methods have also standardized increasingly over the years. If you look at legacy systems, it's not uncommon to see weird voltages like 550 volts, even though most new lines use something like 750 volts or 1500 volts. All of that makes sense because back in the day before the internet and before transit YouTube channels and large metro networks around the world, it was a lot less clear what the best options were and what everyone else was doing. And so systems kind of cut their own path. Now, if systems, be them London, Toronto, San Francisco, or Beijing, build new lines to international standards, even if they're moving away from the local standard, they are again moving towards an international standard. So for example, Toronto or the Bay Area could move to standard gauge trains, and even though that's not what the Bay Area and Toronto have built with historically, it does make them more internationally standard. And that's beneficial when you want international companies to compete on new trains and designing new lines. The distinction of moving towards an international standard makes a lot of sense, which is why gadget bonds are so strange. Very few systems would consider building a main fundamental transit line, say one that's part of the core subway network in a certain city, as a gadget bond. Mostly. Los Angeles? Come on. Now, maintenance is honestly a very reasonable concern, but I think, like many concerns, it's overplayed. A lot of maintenance equipment is still going to be usable between various lines, even if track gauge and train size are different, because fundamentally, wheels are wheels and rails are rails. And even things like seats and train components you'll see are often standardized between trains that are of different sizes. So just because trains don't look the same doesn't mean they can't share a lot of the same parts. I think if your transit line has a certain critical mass, then it's okay to have its own independent equipment and maintenance facilities. What do I mean by critical mass? Well, if you have a transit line that's reasonably long, so not three stations long, and reasonably frequent, so that the fleet is 
fairly large, then you're constantly going to have to be doing some maintenance on vehicles. Because believe it or not, trains need really regular maintenance because subways are gonna be operating all day and they're gonna be getting a lot of kilometers on them. So heavy maintenance and inspections often have to go on on a monthly basis. And that means even a fairly small line is going to have a pretty significant maintenance workload that demands its own dedicated team of mechanics. Of course, context is everything, and short lines like U4 in Berlin or the yellow line in Montreal, well, they make sense to be connected to a main line where they can piggyback on the maintenance facilities and rolling stock storage of that larger line. But for a proper independent line that has its own significant fleet, I don't think it's a big issue. Of course, if a line is moderately long, it's probably gonna need its own maintenance facility anyways, because constantly transferring trains between lines, especially if the lines are operating at high frequency, is not very convenient. Of course, it's also totally sensible to choose smaller trains for lower demand lines and larger trains for higher demand lines. Though I do think it's unclear if we've settled on whether we should go for longer, narrower trains or wider, shorter trains. It's actually really interesting how much divergence there is in that. So maybe that's the topic of a future video. I think train size is something that people think and talk a lot about when new lines are proposed with different standards, but I think that's maybe because of a bit of rail fan influence crawling into the discussion. I think that this gets overplayed because the size of a train is something that's really tangible. Well, different technologies isn't as tangible. But in reality, the impacts of having a train which isn't right sized for the line it's operating on, so one that's way too small or way too large, are probably much bigger than the impacts on your network of having one line that uses different technology. Especially since, as I've mentioned, a lot of systems have this. In a video about half a year ago, I also talked about how it's really problematic that a lot of transit systems order new trains or trams in massive orders to replace an entire fleet at once. And I think this false sense of economies of scale applies to different transit lines as well. Of course, you're unlikely to find a critical flaw in your subway design specification that forces you to shut a line down, but interlining high-frequency subway lines is also less and less common, especially interlining heavily with more than two routes. I think this is generally a result of new capacity being more and more expensive, and hence branches become less attractive because of the fact that they inefficiently use your capacity. In the same way, as subway networks are pushed closer and closer to the theoretical limits of how many trains can be pushed through a tunnel, it makes less and less sense to have lines which are all interdependent and interconnected. Independent lines makes for a more resilient network, and ideally one that's higher performance. So while in theory, being able to divert trains from one line onto another during a period of disruption might sound like a good idea, like say on a tram network, this is really designing your system around the 1% of times when that might actually make any sense rather than the 99% of the time when you absolutely do not need to do that. As I alluded to, a lot of this can probably be chalked up to changing circumstances. Back when the New York subway and London Underground were in their construction heydays, things were cheaper and simpler. It was a lot easier to justify connecting lines up and connecting them up not just with single tracks so you can move equipment, but so that service can through operate from one line to another. Of course, that was because building new lines was a lot easier back then, and so the capacity of existing infrastructure was not so carefully guarded. At the same time, I think it's way too easy to use band-aid solutions to our problems. For example, ordering large trains instead of learning how to operate your trains more frequently and hence efficiently. At the same time, when we can't build reliable metro networks, or when we can't be imaginative with how metro networks should be designed in 2021 rather than in the 1900s, we lean on weak crutches like interoperability and inefficient maintenance being a real issue. So like with most of the questions I pose in these videos, the answer is, it probably depends. But generally, I think you're fine to go with new trains for a new subway line. And the rail fans will love you for it, me included. Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below and thanks for watching.